Kathy. I am solo here talking to you. But in addition to the podcast that I have, I'm sometimes a guest on other people's podcast. Recently, I was a guest on Dr. Avadia's podcast, and the conversation went so well that I really wanted to share it with you guys. So today, he's going to be a guest on my podcast. Here's his bio. I really hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. After growing up in New York, Dr. Avadia graduated from Accelerated Pre-Med Med program at Penn State University and Jefferson Medical College, now Sydney Kimmel School of Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University. He then went on to complete a residency in general surgery at the University of Medicine Dentistry in New Jersey. I went to school there. Um, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and a fellowship in cardiothoracic surgery at Tufts New England Medical School. Um, Dr. Vadias practiced cardiothoracic surgery in Beaver, PA in Clearwater, Florida. In 2020, he established Ovadia Cardiothoracic Surgery and now works as an independent contractor cardiothoracic surgeon in various locations throughout the U.S. In an effort to overcome his personal lifelong struggle with obesity, Dr. Ovadia adopted a low-carb focused way of eating in 2015. He has maintained a weight loss of nearly 100 pounds and since March of 2019 has maintained a mostly carnivorous way of eating. He has extensively researched the health benefits of low-carb with a focus on heart health through many hours of reading, medical literature, books, and listening to podcasts, as well as personal discussions with many physician leaders and citizens, scientists involved in the low carb movement. He also wrote a book. You're going to love this title, guys. It's called Stay Off My Operating Table. Dr. Vadia discusses the principles of optimizing metabolic health to prevent heart disease and other chronic issues. So I'm going to let Dr. Vadia actually tell Actually, his bio keeps going, but it's long. And I just want to tell you this. He's super impressive. And here's the bottom line, because you know my audience knows I like to do everything in cliff notes. The bottom line is, this guy's the real deal. He is a cardiothoracic surgeon. He goes and fixes people's hearts. And he realizes, he's going to share with us what it takes to not end up on his table. And I really want to bring this to you, because I think one of the things we're missing a lot um, in the functional medicine world is having people from conventional medicine with conventional medicine education kind of come over to this side of the vortex. So welcome to the new method. Thank you, E. It is uh, so great to be here with you. I really love the discussion that we had uh, when you were a guest on my podcast and really looking forward to continuing it. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, the um, intro that you gave, um, you know, and, and talking about sort of crossing over between the, you know, traditional medical space, I guess we could say, and the functional medicine space. And, you know, uh, I fully admit, you know, for a long time, I was a uh, standard physician in the standard medical system. And, you know, I was doing my heart surgery and I, you know, was following uh, standard advice. And that led me to a place that I was very unhealthy. And I was recognizing that it really wasn't serving my patients well. And uh, through my personal journey first to overcome my own health challenges, and then uh, that now has spilled to my professional life as well, where I realized that there's a better way uh, for me to be helping people. And that's my mission now to keep people off of my operating table, uh, because the reality is, is that the surgery that I do, yes, it's a, a great help to people um, at the time that they need it, but they would be much better off if they never needed the surgery in the first place. Amen. And you know, you brought up a, a lot of really good points in this, in that I find that most of the people in functional medicine, because functional medicine... Um, to, I, I don't know if you were actually certified, I went to school for it, but in functional medicine, we're all providers first, NPs, PAs, MDs. And on this side, it's either we've gone through personal, uh, a personal journey ourselves or someone that we love has gone through a personal journey and conventional medicine, which is wonderful. I'm not against conventional medicine at all. Um, in fact, I believe what we're doing is conventional medicine done right. Um, we ha we find out that there's limitations or inaccuracies, and then we have to kind of dig a little deeper. So I just want to paint a picture that you were at the time a cardiothoracic surgeon cutting people open, fixing their hearts, but you were obese, right? Yeah. And did that ever occur to you or anyone else how incongruous that is? 
Well, you know, it, it really should have. Uh, and, and to clarify, you know, I wasn't just obese. I was morbidly obese. Um, you know, I was pre-diabetic and I was clearly uh, pretty unhealthy. Um, you know, I'm sure some patients may have been thinking that, uh, but, you know, <laughs> no one really ever said anything to me. And quite frankly, none of my colleagues did either. Um, and it's interesting as, and as we go along and talk about my journey, you know, one of the things we may touch on is, you know, my colleagues are more concerned about my health now <laughs> than they were <laughs> back then, um, which is pretty ironic. But, um, you know, I, I think on some level, you know, I understood it to be, you know, incongruent. Um, but really, I didn't know what to do about it because, you know, at that time, I was following all of the advice that I had learned to give um, in school. You know, I had done the eat less, move more and, and you know, eat a low fat diet and count your calories. Um, and, you know, I had some short term successes, but really it wasn't, you know, successful over the long term. And I, like many others, uh, I think many of our colleagues, you know, chalked it up to, oh, it's my genetics and, mm -hmm. you know, oh, you know, uh, this and that. And, you know, I would make the usual excuses, you know, I'm too busy being a heart surgeon to, you know, go to the gym and pay attention to my own health. Um, but, you know, now looking back, I can clearly see, uh, you know, how problematic that should have been uh, for people. And, uh, you know, but unfortunately, our healthcare system um, is geared towards taking care of sick people, fixing their problems when they are sick. And, you know, quite frankly, I was very, you know, I am very good at doing that as a heart surgeon. Uh, you know, I get good results. I took good care of my patients. I take good care of my patients. So um, on some level, I guess that's all that really mattered uh, to the healthcare system. Uh, and, uh, but I now realize how much better we can and should be doing. And so that's where the integration, like you said, between the functional and, the, you know, osteopathic traditional medicine comes into play. So what was the moment when you were like, this, this is not making sense. What, what tipped you over the edge to start going down the vortex? Yeah, so really, um, you know, it started for me, I was actually, ironically enough, at a uh, medical conference at the Society of Thoracic Surgeons, and the guest speaker uh, that year was uh, Gary Taubes, uh, the author and journalist, and uh, Gary started talking about, you know, at the time he had just written uh, the case against sugar, and he started talking about the types of food that we eat being more important than the amount of food that we eat. And that, you know, it wasn't about, you know, it wasn't about being, uh, you know, low fat. It was really about, you know, a low sugar diet is probably the best way uh, to achieve good health. And it made a lot of sense. And, you know, I said, okay, let me try it. You know, nothing else has worked for me. So let me try this. And I did, and I had good success with it. And that led me to ask, why hadn't I heard about this? Mm -hmm. You know, why did I learn about this from uh, a journalist? And again, that's not said in any negative way, you know, and, and Gary, I highly respect. Um, but why did I hear about this from a journalist instead of from my colleagues? Or why didn't I learn about this in medical school? Um, and that, you know, led me down to a journey to, you know, ask lots of different questions. And as you said, sort of get deeper and deeper into the vortex and ultimately to really question, you know, what really is the root cause of heart disease? You know, the disease that I had been I had dedicated my career to treating and I came to realize that I didn't even properly understand what caused it in the first place. Oh my goodness. Okay. So what causes it in the first place? Yeah, well, it's the food we eat first and foremost, and it is, um, you know, what we call metabolic health. Uh, and, you know, if you want to get very medical, you call that insulin resistance. Um, but uh, ultimately, you know, it is eating the wrong foods and, you know, and some of your habits, you know, things like smoking, uh, you know, come into play as well. 
but what's really ironic is, um, and maybe ironic isn't quite the right term for it, but um, one of the sort of shocking things that I came to learn uh, is that, you know, the things that we do in medicine to try and prevent heart disease, telling people to eat a low fat diet is actually making the problem worse. Um, because again, it's looking at the problem from the wrong standpoint. You know, it's looking at a downstream player in the process, cholesterol. And it's saying, okay, well, if we attack the cholesterol, uh, we're going to fix the problem. Uh, but cholesterol is not the root cause. It's a, like I said, it's a one step down the stream in the process that, that you know, contributes to heart disease. Uh, but because we're not addressing the root cause, we end up actually making the problem worse. Absolutely. And so, you know, I'm, I'm I want to make sure that everyone who's listening knows this is one of the things when I first started talking about nutrition, I felt that some people in the audience were triggered like, oh, because I'm talking about diet or weight. And this is really not that conversation. The conversation is not about weight loss. Um, I mean, that will happen. But the conversation is about the quality of the nutrition that you're eating, because I have plenty of what would be considered thin patients who are insulin resistant and have a really high cardiac risk. So this is not a conversation of what you weigh on the scale or how you look in a bikini. This is really a conversation of the quality of nutrition, the inflammation it creates um, and what it does metabolically to your body. Um, so, I mean, you could be relatively thin, but you're eating potato chips all day long. This is not going to work out for you or maybe not potato chips something what's low fat a low fat you know cookie because that's low fat and you're eating it all day long because you're thought of low fat means good and you're actually creating insulin resistance so uh, i'm glad you say that so if you're saying cholesterol is not the root cause when you say root cause then it's inflammation or sugar yeah well so you know i would say it's inflammation it's blood vessel damage and then we have to say okay what's causing the blood vessel damage and sugar is one of the major things there um you know and we you know again we know this we have the science to show this um we just don't pay attention to it because um you know it doesn't fit into that paradigm uh, that medicine likes that, you know, we give a medication or we do a procedure, uh, you know, to address the problem. And um, we don't have the only way to address, uh, you know, metabolic health and insulin resistance is through diet and lifestyle changes. Uh, and those are hard for uh, the traditional medical system to really, you know, wrap its head around and put into practice. You know, our medical model uh, does not support doing that. You know, you know, uh, and I know, you know, that that involves time, it involves the conversations, educating the patients. And uh, quite frankly, you know, our medical system has become overwhelmed taking care of sick people. Um, and it just doesn't really leave time to ask those questions of what should we be doing to keep people from getting sick in the first place? Absolutely. Healthcare is a misnomer. It's absolutely sick care. We yep. are, we are, you know, a, what we do all day is take care of the sick, but to really move the needle on health would be to have prevention, to have time. And the, the system would have to pay to give you the time it would take to really get down to figure out lifestyle modifications. Like, hey, Mr. Smith, what's in your way? Is it because, you know, you have two jobs as a heart for you? Well, let me talk to you about what you can get, like at a fast, what choices you can make at a fast food restaurant. Like what's the reality of your world, right? That takes time to just, you handing out a piece of paper is not what it's about. Where, what are your limitations in your life? Is it financial? Is it time? Is it because you have six kids at home? Let's work through that. Let's come up with better options. All of that takes time. And it's, it's not possible in a five minute window and you need to see people in a five minute window because that's how the fee structure is made. So it's really designed to keep people sick. That is a whole episode in itself. Um, but I, I, I want to say that because it, it's impossible to ask this of your primary care provider or anyone who's insurance based. It is impossible. Don't get mad at them. Um, it's possible one, they didn't learn it in school. And two, the system does not allow them to delve into it. 
Um, but I want to ask you why did cholesterol get center stage? Well, you know, it's interesting when you look at the, uh, the, the journey as to how we got here and believing that cholesterol is the uh, sort of end all and be all when it comes to heart health. And, you know, it really starts with some uh, science. Uh, you know, we really have to go back to the 1950s. Uh, and at that time, um, the incidence of heart disease was rising at a very alarming rate. And uh, our president, you know, the president of the United States had a heart attack while he was in office. Uh, and this, you know, appropriately set off the alarm bells. And there were really two competing schools of thought at that time as to what was causing heart disease. And it basically came down to, um, you know, sugar, um, which there was a lot of science to support uh, as being the primary driver of heart disease. And then there was, um, you know, dietary fat. Um, and specifically, there was a scientist at the time by the name of Ansel Keys, who was very, you know, promoting the theory that it was the fat in the diet uh, that was causing heart disease. We know in retrospect that a lot of his science was somewhere between poorly done and intentionally uh, misleading. Wow. And, and, you know, uh, we look at something like uh, what became, you know, the foundation of the diet heart hypothesis, which said that the, you know, the amount of fat that we eat, specifically the amount of saturated fat that we eat in our diet, um, increases our blood cholesterol level. And that increased blood cholesterol level is then, you know, what leads to heart disease. Um, the, the, the study that Ansel Keys, you know, put forward uh, to support that theory, it was called the six country study. Um, there was a follow up called the seven country study, but basically what he purported to show uh, in that study was that the amount of saturated fat uh, that's eaten at the population level, you know, in, in countries um, correlated to the amount of heart disease that occurs in those countries. And he has this beautiful graph with the six countries and it's a nice straight line showing this relationship. The problem is that Ansel Keys had access to 22 countries data. And when you plot out all 22 countries, there's really no relationship there. Uh, but he handpicked the six countries that make that nice graph. Um, and he ignored other countries like France uh, that at the time had the highest, you know, the highest consumption of saturated fat and the lowest incidence of heart disease. Uh, so, um, you know, yeah, very convenient. And then Ansel Keys was, you know, quite frankly, uh, very good at public relations, at promoting his theories. Um, and he was able to get, you know, uh, on the medical team. Um, you know, that was uh, taking care of the president at the time. And then he became ingrained with the American Heart Association and was able to push his uh, theory forward. Um, but the problem is here we are 70 years later and neither part of that hypothesis has ever been shown to be definitively true. Uh, we have lots of conflicting science um, around the relationship between how much saturated fat you consume and your blood cholesterol levels. And we have lots of conflicting science um, between your blood cholesterol levels and whether or not you get heart disease. Um, yet it just has become the popular theory. The, what really then pushed it forward was in the late 1980s when we developed medications to lower blood cholesterol levels. And uh, once the pharmaceutical industry basically got involved in this, um, they, you know, put their PR machine on it and cholesterol became all that doctors talked about. Um, they got involved with the medical education system. They get involved with uh, setting the guidelines that doctors are supposed to be following. And here we are, um, you know, 30 years later from there, uh, approaching 40 years later now, um, statin medications, the medications that lower cholesterol are the most widely prescribed class of medications. 
And yet heart disease remains the number one killer uh, in the United States. So um, those are the facts that don't quite line up for me. And uh, these are the things that I started to have more questions about. And, uh, and like I said, when you really do dig into the science, you can see that cholesterol clearly isn't the whole story. Is it part of the story? Yes, it is. Um, but it's not the whole story. It's not the root cause. And therefore, just focusing on cholesterol is a very ineffective way of trying to deal with the heart disease problem. This, this is amazing. So, so there's like a few things happening. So what we're saying is that, that fat is not necessarily, the, number one is that fat is not necessarily the cause of increase in cholesterol. And two, that cholesterol is not necessarily the, the, the cause of heart disease, right? Because, and we're in a country right. that has the most amount of low fat foods, yet here are cholesterol. And yep. as you said, the most amount of statins. And so then a lot of people will say, well, then why are statins prescribed? And why are statins working? And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the answer is not necessarily because they're reducing cholesterol, but because they're reducing inflammation. Right. So yeah, exactly. So, you know, what you see when you really look at the data around statins is that there is a small effect um, on the incidence of heart disease. Um, but interestingly, that um, effect is not related to how much you lower someone's cholesterol level with statins. Uh, and the, the, you know, what I think is a theory that makes a lot of sense, um, really not investigated because quite frankly, I don't think the drug companies really want people to know this, but when you really look at it, it is probably the anti-inflammatory effect that statins have that lead to most of their benefit. So in essence, if we have high cholesterol, and we're not telling anyone to come off of meds or giving medical advice. But if there was a way for us to reduce inflammation and we could do that, that would be as effective as taking statins because ultimately what we're trying to do is reduce inflammation. Is that accurate? Yeah, I would definitely say so. And, you know, my message to anyone who is, uh, you know, dealing with heart disease or concerned about heart disease is, you know, figure out. Um, where you stand in terms of inflammation, um, figure out where you stand in terms of insulin sensitivity uh, or insulin resistance, um, and you know address those issues first and foremost. Uh, because when you eliminate inflammation and you eliminate insulin resistance, um, you eliminate the vast majority of heart disease. Um, we have data going back again to the 1970s and the 1980s uh, showing that, you know, 95% of patients who come into the hospital with a heart attack are insulin resistant if you measure it the right way. Um, when you look at the data on cholesterol, it is nowhere near as clean. Um, the, you know, the, the studies that looked at patients who came into the hospital with heart attacks before we had statin drugs, um, you know, before we were lowering people's uh, cholesterol with medications, it showed that basically 50% of them had what today is considered low cholesterol, a good cholesterol level, and 50% of them didn't. Uh, so, you know, again, it, it really shows you that cholesterol is not uh, the key to heart disease. So how would you say is the best way to measure inflammation? Are we talking about just CRP or do you have another way? Well, yeah. So I really step back, you know, and uh, uh, we want to look at the metabolic health picture. You know, that, that's really what we want to look at. And there are five basic measures for that that I, I encourage people to pay attention to. Um, you know, two of them aren't even blood tests. Uh, two of them are things you can measure at home. Your waist circumference and your blood pressure. Um, then we look at a couple of blood tests. We wanna look at your fasting blood glucose level, and we wanna look at your HDL cholesterol, that good cholesterol number, and we wanna look at your triglycerides. Um, we're not looking at your LDL cholesterol, the number that most doctors focus so much on. Um, the interesting thing about the HDL and the triglycerides is that it is a indirect way to get a sense of whether or not you are insulin resistant. Ideally, you wanna do the direct measures of your insulin resistance. You wanna get your fasting insulin level, 
Um, you want to uh, maybe do what's called a craft test uh, to help you figure out if you're insulin resistant or not. Um, but um, that's what we're really trying to figure out. You know, inflammation is another, you know, something else to be paying attention to. Um, I think that CRP, like you mentioned, is probably the best test to do that. Um, but, you know, if, if you're just looking at your metabolic health with those five metrics, you're going to get a pretty good sense of whether you need to be concerned or not. That is really great. When you say waist circumference, what is the parameters? Yeah, so um, if you are a man, you want that to be less than 40 inches. If you're a woman, you want it to be less than 35 inches is the uh, cutoff that we're looking at there. Okay, and I, that's interesting that you say waist circumference because um, it gets rid of the whole BMI concept, which is so problematic. Exactly. You know, the reason that waist circumference um, in and of itself is such a powerful measure is because it really reflects whether or not you have visceral fat, the fat on the inside. And again, the visceral fat is kind of where um, a lot of the um, inflammation starts from. Um, it's our body's response uh, to um you know, being in a poor metabolic state, our body starts to uh, build up this visceral fat around our organs. And that again, ends up secreting a lot of the hormones and, mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that come into play in the whole process. Uh, but again, if you're looking for sort of root cause measurements, um, we know that reducing visceral fat uh, improves your overall health and lowers your risk of disease. Uh, so um, visceral fat is a great thing to pay attention to. It's just hard to measure. So the indirect measure, the best thing we have is your waist circumference. Absolutely. So I like to tell my patients, I'm like visceral fat. So visceral is a fancy word for organs. So if you, you don't want your organs surrounded by fat. So when you eat more than you need to, um, Right. So we're, we always kind of know, okay, well, I'm not diabetic. I, I checked, I went for my annual, I'm not diabetic. I must be fine. But there are years and years before you become diabetic where you are in this insulin resistance stage and you might not know it because every time you go get your A1C check, it's fine. You might not even be pre-diabetic if that's what you're looking for. In fact, I used to believe that A1C pre-diabetes was like an early marker of diabetes. I've come to appreciate that's pretty late. So as you consume more and more food, more than you need, I'm not saying you're out there engorging yourself, but more than you need, um, your body doesn't know what to do with it. So one of the things it does is it starts to create fat and it kind of wraps your organs in fat. Um, and so, and, and by default, since now your organs have fat, your waist can get bigger. And so um, checking your waist, and, and so the best way to see it would be with ultrasound, but who's gonna get ultrasound all the time? So what you're saying is that, okay, the waist circumference gives an indirect measure of like, well, you probably don't have too much visceral fat, too much fat surrounding your organs if your waist is under 40 for men and under 35 for women. I love that. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know, look up why BMI is racist and, situ and it's a problem. We're forced to use it in medical offices because that's what insurance wants us to see. But using the waist is so direct and gets rid of like all that nonsense. So that is great. Uh, blood pressure being high, is kind of obvious and you can do this at home. And it's really important that everyone does that at home um, because it's a silent killer. You don't even know you have high blood pressure. So do those two things at home. If those two things are off, it's probably time to come in to see your primary care. But then even when you see your primary care, <laughs> you're kind of screwed because they're just going to do an A1C. So you have to be savvy enough to ask, hey, I don't want just the A1C, right? Because the A1C, for those of you who don't know, is kind of like a three-month average of the sugar that you have in your blood, but you may not have excess sugar yet in your blood. You may not be at that point yet. So there is the average looks normal. So you want to go before that. The, you know, the fasting blood glucose is when you're fasting, that should be low to normal. And if it's high, that's problematic. And that might happen for a long time before your A1C shifts. Tell me why um, you don't focus on the LDL and why everyone else does. 
Well, yeah, like I said, you know, when you look at the um, the the statistics around LDL, you just see that it is a lousy marker. Um, you know, half of the patients who come in with heart attacks have a, a, a normal, oh, you know, what would be considered a low to normal LDL level. Um, so uh, ultimately, I just, uh, you know, and the other thing that I see, um, you know, as a heart surgeon is that you know, a lot of the patients who end up on my operating table um, have low LDL levels. Some of them are on medications to lower their LDL. Some of them are not. They just have naturally low LDL levels. So I just don't think it's a good enough marker for us to be focused on. And I think the real problem is, is that it distracts from those other markers. Uh, you know, mm. we if we were putting our efforts into uh, measuring insulin levels and, um, you know, measuring these metabolic health measures, um, we would be making much better progress uh, against the problem. And so that, that ultimately becomes my problem with LDL um, is that it, it distracts us from what we should be focused on. The other issue that I have with LDL is, you know, outside of the medications, um, the other advice we give in this effort to lower your LDL cholesterol level is to eat a low fat diet and to eat, um, you know, overly processed foods. Uh, we have to realize that low fat foods are processed foods. They have been altered to take out the fat and to put in something else. And usually that something else is sugar. Um, and so it, like I said, it ends up making the problem worse. Um, we also, you know, uh, promote these highly processed uh, vegetable and seed oils because they lower LDL cholesterol levels. And yes, they lower LDL cholesterol, but they don't prevent heart disease. And again, there are, there's science to show uh, that the more of these you consume, um, the worse your overall health becomes, the shorter you actually live. Uh, when you're consuming these vegetable and seed oils, but we get distracted because we see that it lowers LDL cholesterol, and we're so convinced that that's a good thing to do. Yeah, that and and Quaker oats for some reason super with cholesterol. I, that's like a head yep. scratcher for me. <laughs> really yeah. Sure. Tell me about why the focus on triglycerides. Is it because it's an indirect measure of how much of sugar? Yeah, exactly. So triglycerides really reflect, um, you know, uh, so what the purpose that triglycerides ultimately serve in the body is that they take um, your uh, excess energy intake um, and they are transporting it basically to your fat cells to be stored. Um, so the more you know, the higher your triglycerides are, um, it basically reflects that you're taking in excess energy, and that's usually in the form of sugar. Um, it really, you know, now that, um, you know, I work with people and we make these dietary modifications and we lower their amount of sugar, we pretty reliably see their um, triglyceride levels coming down. So again, I think that's, it, it, it's sort of an indirect measure, like I said, of of the problem that we're focused on. Um, but it, it it's a it, it's a good enough measure uh, that if someone comes to us and their triglyceride levels are high, we know that there's a problem. It's so funny and it's interesting. Again, no, please. Yeah, when you yeah when you look at the data around um, heart disease, uh, you know, prediction based on blood work. Um, you see pretty consistently in the studies that triglycerides being elevated are a much more powerful predictor of heart disease than your LDL cholesterol being elevated. Um, but again, you know, we don't have drugs that reliably lower triglyceride levels, and therefore we don't focus on it in the medical system. And it's funny because when my patients come in and their triglycerides are high, I'm they're like, oh, I should eat less like fried foods and oil foods. I'm like, no, you need to reduce your carbs. And they're like, what does carbs have to do with it? I'm like, this is this is why your triglycerides are <laughs> because you eat a lot of sugar. And it's hard to wrap yep. around, right? Because we've been taught for so long that that's that you know, the fat. It's it's just fat, and it's and it really isn't. Um, so, uh, where do, do you use the calcium to, uh, score test at all in your in your office? 
And can you tell yeah. like, everyone else what that is and how you use it? Definitely. So the coronary artery calcium scan, um, CAC scan, you'll hear it referred to, um, I believe is one of the best uh, tests to determine if you have early evidence of heart disease. Uh, so again, you know, when we're looking at heart disease and, and you know, um, trying to prevent it from becoming a significant problem way before you have the heart attack, you can find the early signs on a coronary artery calcium scan uh, if you have damage to your heart, damage to the blood vessels in your heart is essentially what we're looking at. So to step back, you know, what is the scan? It is a type of CAT scan, um, CT scan that's done. It's very easy to do. They don't even have to put an IV in you. You literally just lay down on the, on the table. Uh, it takes about five minutes to do the scan. And it's going to show you at the early stages, heart disease developing. And if we can determine who has the early stages of heart disease, we can then you know, really focus on stopping that from getting worse and making the changes that are gonna stop it from getting worse. Uh, so I'm a big fan of the coronary artery calcium scan. I believe they should be you know, utilized way more than they are. Uh, like I said, they're an easy test to do. They're relatively inexpensive. You know, The unfortunate thing is most of the time insurance doesn't uh, cover it, um, but you can find them as cheaply as uh, $50 mm -hmm. in many locations. And at the high end, you know, you're maybe going to pay $200 for it. And I think it's a very worthwhile investment uh, because, again, it will give you an idea of whether or not you have heart disease developing at the early stages. So what, what you're saying, and I want to make sure our listeners understand that, that you might be walking around with a cholesterol number that's high, but if your calcium score is zero and your HDL is good, your waist is good, your blood pressure is good, triglycerides good, your fasting blood, blood glucose is good, that high cholesterol number is pretty much meaningless. Um, yeah. Um, you know, and this is one of the reasons that, uh, coronary artery calcium scans probably don't get used as much as they should, um, <laughs> because you're right. The data shows exactly that. Uh, if you have a coronary artery calcium scan of zero and you have no other risk factors for heart disease, um, no matter what your LDL cholesterol level is, there's not going to be a benefit to using statins in that situation. And since we don't want to disprove the use of statins, we're not going to do the calcium score because we want everyone on a statin. That is, I, I'm being ironic, everyone. I have two patient populations I want to ask you about. One is the postmenopausal female, right? So we know that the postmenopausal female, as a result of sex hormones dropping, will have an elevated cholesterol unrelated to dietary modifications, right? So I'm talking about, you know, uh, you know, you're postmenopausal, you're eating the same way, you're you're eating a healthy diet, and then all of a sudden your cholesterol jumps up. Um, all of a sudden these women are put on statins. And there's like this big fear. Now, it is my understanding that the reason now we do know that postmenopausal women have suddenly a higher risk of cardiac risk, but it's my understanding that it's not because of the cholesterol, it's because they're losing estrogen and estrogen is cardioprotective. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Should we be chasing this postmenopausal cholesterol rise if we know for sure it's secondary? to the hormones as opposed to dietary? Yeah, so, you know, again, when you look at, you know, why do women, um, you know, when they go through menopause, um, you know, kind of all of a sudden become at higher risk of heart disease. Um, and it really, again, seems to track back to that insulin resistance. Um, one of the things that occurs with going through menopause um, because of those hormonal shifts um, is that women become more insulin resistant. Um, and that is really, again, what is driving their risk of heart disease. Um, you know, the whether their cholesterol goes up or not, um, you know, um, again, I would say is probably not relevant, uh, not very relevant to the discussion. And what I focus on with, you know, women, um, Again, postmenopause or premenopause, 
um, you know, is you want to remain insulin sensitive. You want to make sure that you're insulin sensitive. Uh, but, you know, typically what we see is that uh, women are able to maintain that insulin sensitivity uh, until they get to uh, menopause. And that's when it oftentimes uh, becomes uh, apparent. And that's what we should be focusing on with them. And, uh, you know, we, we just do a lousy job of looking at that again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I do have a patient population that insulin resistance is not where it's at and it's definitely, and it just jumps up postmenopausally. And I just really want to kind of drive home the fact that those numbers suddenly being elevated, if everything else is in check is, is, is irrelevant. Again, if everything else is in check, your insulin, you're not insulin resistance, your calcium score is on point and your HDL, like all that is good. Um, what right. about those who say, Hey, it's familial and they really is familial. I've had this, my whole family has this. What's your answer to them? Why is it that yeah, so you, feel they're a higher risk? Yeah, so true um, familial hypercholesterolemia, you know, which uh, means that you have certain genetic, uh, you know, changes um, that truly cause you to have an increased level of cholesterol. And these are people who usually have very high levels of cholesterol. Uh, typically, you know, over 300 is when we start, you know, considering that as a diagnosis. Mm. Um, and it's interesting when you look at familial hypercholesterolemia, um, that yes, it does increase your risk for heart disease, um, but really not quite as much as you would predict it would. And it may, again, not have really a whole lot to do with the cholesterol itself. Um, one of the other features of familial hypercholesterolemia is that many of these patients have uh, alterations in their blood clotting uh, that makes them more prone to uh, blood clot formation, which does play a part as well in the development of um, heart disease and having heart attacks and strokes. Um, so, um, familial hypercholesterolemia, if you truly have it, uh, is certainly a situation where you want to be working with a physician who understands that and can help you understand, you know, is it the cholesterol? Is it something else? How much do I need to be paying attention to it? Uh, but again, understand that that is a relatively uh, uncommon uh, condition. The reason that heart disease really appears to run in families and the reason that we sort of have this notion that it's genetic is because families pass down habits, yes. uh, just like they pass down genetics. And I really do believe it's the habits that are more important. <laughs> um, and, you know, when you I, I have many, many patients now and they have strong family histories of heart disease uh, and, you know, they make these changes. They pay attention to their diet and lifestyle. They get their insulin sensitivity back. You know, they get all their other uh, m markers in line. And, you know, th it doesn't seem that they are uh, any longer at high risk of heart disease. Um, the other interesting thing about the genetic, you know, sort of argument um, around heart disease is that heart disease has really only been a problem, uh, you know, for people here in the United States, like I said, 1950s is when it started elevating. Um, but it really, you know, heart disease was almost undescribed prior to 1900. Um, we have reports from many prominent physicians, the busiest physicians of the time, uh, from, you know, the early 1900s, the late 1800s, and they basically never saw heart disease. Uh, so um, genetics, you know, on the population level, don't change that quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, human genetics have not changed in the past 150 years. Something else must be driving the heart disease. And what has changed in the past 150 years, again, are our habits, are the foods that we are eating. Uh, so that is really, you know, the explanation for why heart disease has become such a prominent problem. Oh my God. That was great. It's, it's so true. It's the habits that are passed on. Um, then yeah, 100%. Um, I have one last question for you. Um, and so we, you and I agree on everything, except I feel like where we differ is that you call yourself a, a carnivore, which I do not call myself a carnivore. I would say that I, I promote, and then I want to give you opportunity to explain your side. I promote 
what I call plant-based, meaning I want your plate to be as colorful as possible with plants with, unless it's ethically against, you know, your beliefs with a animal protein on that plate. But I want there to also be a lot of plants. When I hear the word carnivore, I feel like there's less of a focus on the plants as well and more a focus on the animal protein. So can you tell me what you mean by promoting a carnivore diet? Yeah, sure thing. So, you know, my first, uh, my high level principle around uh, what we should be eating is we should be eating whole real food first and foremost. Amen. Um, and I am open to, uh, you know, the variation that will come within that, you know, it can be, you, you can do a whole real food diet um, as a vegan and as a carnivore. Um, and honestly, I don't know for sure that there is uh, unique advantages to one over the other. Um, what I do see, though, is, um, you know, first of all, I think a lot of vegan diets end up being highly processed. Um, you know, all of this fake Tater meat chip stuff. vegans, I call uh, it. Yeah. And or <laughs> Oreos are technically vegan, yes. you know. Yes. Uh, yeah. And, you know on the meat side of things, we see less of that. Um, yes, there are processed meats. Um, but you know, I think it becomes less of a problem. I also look at, um, you know, we as human beings evolved eating meat. Uh, there is absolutely zero evidence that, you know, red meat is harmful to our health, uh, in well done studies. You know, we have some low quality evidence again, uh, but we don't have any good evidence that red meat by itself is harmful to health. So I want people to understand it's okay to be eating red meat. Um, it's okay to be eating vegetables, um, but there's also nothing unique uh, that you can get from vet, that you get from vegetables that you can't get from eating meat. Um, and so, you know, um, the opposite can't be said, you know, uh, about, we know that if you. So, so I agree with you. I think, um, I think the vegan diet is a little bit harder to achieve yeah. uh, getting all the nutrients because you could very easily be carb heavy. I agree with you. So when I say plant-based, I definitely don't mean vegan. Uh, I do have right. some patients that are vegan. It's challenging because getting all that, right. Yep. But what about the phytonutrients? How are you getting that in your meat unless you're saying secondary to the animal eating it, you're getting it. Well, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, the okay. animal eats the plants. Um, the animal, especially ruminant animals, are uniquely designed to extract nutrients from plants. We as humans, you know, being monogastric, having one stomach, uh, we can't as effectively extract those nutrients. So I would rather let that cow do the work for me. <laughs> and then, you know, I eat the cow and I get the uh, benefits of eating the cow. Um, you know, so that has what that is what I have found works best for me. Um, I do not tell all my patients you you need to be carnivore. I think if you're doing a mixed whole food diet, you know, you're eating plants, you're eating animals, I think you're going to be fine. Um, it just, uh, you know, a, a lot of it comes down to, um, one of my other principles. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're battling obesity, you want to make yourself hungry less often. And the best way to be hungry less often is to be eating a lot of animal protein. Um, and so, uh, that's why, yep. The fat and the protein keeps you full. And uh, I think it's hard to get that same level of satiation from a primarily plant-based diet. You know, when I look at my, uh, you know, when I look at my patients or my friends who are doing, you know, more of a whole food plant-based diet, uh, one of the things you notice is they're eating almost all the time, uh, you know, as, as opposed to people on carnivore diets you know, I'm hungry once, maybe twice a day, you know, I typically eat once or twice a day, not because I'm intentionally, you know, fasting or, you know, restricting myself from eating. It's just I'm truly only hungry, you know, if I sit down and I have a big meal of, of animal protein that keeps me from being hungry. So that's why carnivore has worked best for me. Uh, like I said, I don't tell everyone they need to be carnivore. Um, I do have concerns about being vegan diets. And I think if you're going to do a vegan diet, you know, like I said, it needs to be a whole food, 
vegan diet. You can't be eating processed food and you're going to have to supplement because there are mm. certain essential nutrients that you can't get from plants alone. Uh, but if you want to incorporate some plants, um, you know, along with your whole food diet, honestly, I don't have much trouble with that. Uh, fruit, fruit can be a different issue. You know, if mm. you're metabolically unhealthy, we need to acknowledge that fruit is sugar. And so you have to be careful about that. Uh, but the, the vegetables, yeah, I don't have much problem with yeah. it. I just want people to understand they're also not essential. You can be very healthy without eating them. So it, it comes down to a lot of what your preference is. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with a lot with saying. I do agree that uh, vegan diet is challenging because it's very easy to go process and they do need to supplement. Um, fruit is a problem because sometimes I'll have people come in and say, oh, you know, I had a fruit smoothie. I'm like, you just had a glass full of sugar. It's just God's sugar. It's still sugar. <laughs> so that's a, that is a problem when you're trying to, um, especially when you're trying to lose weight or re reduce insulin resistance, it's still sugar. Um, I am still a big fan. This is where we don't agree. I am still a big fan of making sure your food has a lot of colors on it along with an animal protein. But I think ultimately you're achieving by eating uh, mostly um, animal protein. And I also am a big fan of intermittent fasting. You are achieving that metabolic flexibility where you are burning fat for fuel as opposed to carbs. We're just getting there yep. a little differently. But I think that's, that is what keeps you efficient. That is what keeps you less hungry. Um, and ultimately, I think you and I are getting to the same place, small, slightly different pathway, but still in, in the same, with the same idea in mind. Um, yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. I think when you really look at it, the difference between, you know, you and I um, is, is pretty small. Um, and we all agree on the same thing, you know, yeah. don't eat the processed food. Eat the processed uh, food. And I think Slow that's really car. rule number one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. If someone comes to me and they say, I'm not eating processed food, uh, you know, I I'm going to be pretty happy with what they're doing. And, uh, you know, maybe we're going to be doing some minor tweaking from there. Uh, but if you get to that point that you're not eating processed food, it's probably a very small uh, difference as to whether you're doing it as a meat heavy or a plant heavy diet. I love that. And, and just, and if someone is on the verge of, if someone's being told they need a statin, how much time, if they say, listen, I don't want to do this. This is my wake up call. I, I really want to turn this around. How much time would you give them? Would you say three months? Hey, let's see if we could turn this around in three months before you said, no, you really, is there ever a time when you're like, dude, you just got to go on the statin? Honestly, the only time that I think it makes sense to go on a statin is if you're not going to address the underlying metabolic health problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if you want to just keep eating your processed food and you're not focusing on your metabolic health, then yes, there may be a small uh, benefit to being on the statin versus not being on the statin. But I want people to understand that being on the statin alone is really not going to I address your problem. Need. It's not going to correct your problem. Um, you know, you can see changes in your metabolic health very, very quickly. Um, within a couple of weeks, I oftentimes see people's blood measures improving. Um, if you're looking at uh, visceral fat levels uh, or, uh, you know, fatty liver disease is sometimes the best way that we look at this, you can see that start to reverse pretty quickly within a few weeks when you eliminate processed food and you minimize your carbohydrate intake, um, you know, these measures get better very quickly. Um, one of the ways that it shows up most, you know, with the patients I work with, they come to me and they're on high blood pressure medication and they're on diabetes medications uh, to control their blood sugar and they stop eating the processed food and they stop eating the processed carbohydrates. And, you know, within a couple of weeks, uh, oftentimes, you know, their blood sugar is getting too low and their blood pressure is getting too low yes. and we need to cut back the medications. Uh, so, you know, that shows you how quickly the body can start to respond. Uh, you know, are you undoing all the damage in that time? No, of course not. If sure. you've been doing, you know, if you have, you know, 40, 50 years of damage built up, it's going to take longer to really start to undo that. But you can at least start to, you see that you're moving in the right direction. This is amazing. Dr. Vaya, tell people how they can reach you if they want to set up a time to meet you. 
Yeah, sure thing. So uh, the best place to go is to my website, ifixhearts.com. Um, all the uh, all my resources are, are kind of linked there. I have uh, the book, like you mentioned, Stay Off My Operating Table. Um, I have courses that people can take, just kind of self-study courses about metabolic health. Um, we have group coaching programs, and, uh, and then I have my private medical practice, Ovadia Heart Health, where I work with people one-on-one -on, -one on these issues. Uh, if you want to come find me on social media, I'm most active over on Twitter. Again, iFixHearts. Uh, you can also find me on Instagram, uh, YouTube. Uh, I haven't done the TikTok thing yet, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, on, on all the other uh, social media places, you'll usually find me. That's amazing. Um, this was as amazing as it was when I was on your podcast. This is so wonderful. I really appreciate your time. Um, so now you guys know where to find Dr. Vadia. He's amazing. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you.